First of all, uh, this is what I understand the agenda is today. First of all, I'd just like to tell you about uh, uh, Becca. Uh, Becca is, um, is New Zealand's largest uh, employee-owned uh, consulting services company uh, in, in New Zealand. We have uh, two and a half thousand people and we're owned by about a third of those people with uh, big business now in Australia and Singapore and uh, in, uh, in China. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, an earthquake engineer's perspective on the, on the building performance. Um, I've been asked to comment on is our building code the right one for our country? What's realistic preparation for f future events and future building code enhancements to suit emergency management? Well, uh, I don't have uh, too many uh, bright ideas about that, but there's no doubt that the 4th of September earthquake 2010 was a very convenient dress rehearsal for the, the one that followed. Uh, and the 22nd of February earthquake was massive, but don't tell me it was unexpected. I started off my interest in earthquake engineering because of an earthquake that I felt in Christchurch on the um, 25th of on 25th of uh, May 1968 at 5.24am, it was just after capping, I was a university student, I thought, uh, what was I doing last night during capping? The ground was shaking, as students know, but it was the Nangahura earthquake. And, uh, and walls fell down, some garden walls fell down in Christchurch, as I remember, and the devastation across uh, in, uh, around Reefton and Nangahura was huge. If you go and look up all the reports on that, you'd be surprised to see the familiarity with uh, things that have happened since then. I, I believe that most modern buildings, and my definition of modern is uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, performed extremely well. Just remember that we uh, don't know what any one building was shaken how much it was shaken in Christchurch. They're not instrumented. I'll just talk a bit about that later. I certainly believe that the rapid assessment process was exemplary, and as uh, earthquake engineers, we were, we were, not, we were not well prepared for the post-earthquake uh, public reaction to that, and not many accolades for engineers, uh, particularly in the nominations for awards last, uh, last week. I, I, uh, looked through, not with much expectation, but uh, engineers were not thought about at all. What about some of these people? This is uh, the guy I came to work for in Wellington, John Hollings, who really uh, started, um, pushed the university to get stuck into uh, putting ductility into buildings, uh, and that craze went right around the world, so that New Zealand's uh, uh, expertise in that was adopted by most of the uh, earthquake countries in the world. Tom Paulet, another one. If you went to an overseas conference or if I go to parts of Europe now and I say I was taught by Tom Paulet, they just about fall down at my feet because of Tom Paulet's huge intellect from the University of Canterbury in changing things. So that death toll in Christchurch was pretty small and I like to think that a lot of it was because of um, the huge amount of preparation that had been gone in. Here's another one who a gentleman who died just a few months ago, Bill Robinson, who thought up the idea of the base isolation bearing with the lead inside it, uh, which was under the uh, Christchurch Women's Hospital. So, some of the things I'd like to talk to you just about um, earthquake resilience. Earthquake proof, don't know what that means. Waterproof for the watch, I've got some idea, five meters might be all right. But uh, we don't know what earthquake proof means. We keep on begging journalists not to use that because it gives the wrong impression. Uh, uh, brittle versus ductile, uh, I'll explain a little bit about that. And as I've said, New Zealand is actually a leader in earthquake resilience and the rest of the world is extremely interested in what went on in Christchurch because it was a huge laboratory. We tested buildings beyond uh, the level to which they were uh, nominally designed. Um, so, Earthquake Engineering 101. I hope it's not too onerous and there's no test. Uh, it's as much of an art as it is a science. You can go so far with the science, but in the end, it 
comes down to the sp skill of the experienced person to, to make a building uh, uh, earthquake resilient. And there is a tendency to rely a lot on computers now. Um, they are a good first step towards getting your building there. Uh, but in the end, it comes down to the skill of the person who actually details the way in which the building comes together. Uh, just so, compliance with the letter of the building code is not enough. Uh, the building code sets minimum standards. And uh, if you saw the thickness of the codes that we work to, it's a wonder that we uh, get it half right. There are so many things that we are uh, required to check uh, when we are making the design. But the decisions that are made at the time the project is formulated for building a construction uh, often uh, put the seal on what actually happens in the earthquake. And uh, I, I, you know we're dealing with a lot of buildings built in the 1980s. I can tell you stories about developers who, uh, who said to one of my colleagues, I know one developer said, looking at the drawings, uh, tell me, uh, your building looks a bit um, heavy, a bit costly. Is this bit of steel here required by the code? And uh, the, the uh, director at the time said, uh, no, sir, but um, I know that it's necessary. He said, take it out. We never worked for any developers over that period of time after that experience. And thank God, because some engineers went down with the developers. Uh, so that's... A, uh, just remember, um, when you are trying to buy the cheapest engineering advice, you might get a very minimum standards building which still uh, uh, meets the code requirements. So here's the first little lesson. <laughs> do you, here's one of the secrets how, do you, how you make a building stand up in an earthquake. Imagine uh, your building to be an uh, aluminium ladder with its legs grouted into the concrete and you're trying to push it sideways to fail it. Now, if on the, uh, the left-hand side of the rungs of the ladder, the green one, if the, lungs of the, if the rungs of the ladder are uh, less strong than the, the supports, the, the vertical members, you can see that um, to make it fail with its feet stuck in the foundations, you've got to actually get it to uh, break up in all those little yellow points before it will actually fall over sideways. And so uh, you can see that on the, on the orange one, that if you, um, if, if you make the beams, the horizontal uh, parts of the building, stronger than the columns, you can actually get it to fail just in one story. So this was quite a breakthrough, believe it or not, in the, in the late 60s and the 70s to realize that this was one way of making a building very resilient to earthquakes. So uh, strong columns, weak beams, uh, beats, weak columns, uh, strong beams, simple as that. The next thing is that uh, uh, if you have something that's inherently uh, brittle, then um, one way you can save that element is to put something in that is uh, uh, ductile. And here's a simple example of a, of a chain. You've got brittle links, so you put in the middle link which has um, ductile capacity that is uh, uh, less than uh, uh, it, it will start to go ductile uh, before the brittle parts fail. And I just have to produce some props just to bring this home to you so you don't forget. Um, it's not the, been used a few times, this is the coat hanger, because it always goes back to shape. But this other thing is my lunch, um, a carrot. Now, a carrot is a good example of uh, what uh, makes up most buildings, concrete. And uh, this is essentially a brittle substance, carrot, like concrete, and you can bend it backwards and forwards as much as you like for a certain level and nothing happens. And uh, CTV building, from the first earthquake. Nothing happens, it looks fine afterwards, but go a wee bit too far and it's all over. It's got no more resilience, it's broken. Thank you, Mr. Carrot. Uh, take, for instance, now uh, your standard wire coat hanger. You do have to be careful these days because of the quality of the steel in some of the coat hangers. 
Uh, but in general terms, and I'll pick a part where I haven't done it before, you can bend the coat hanger piece of wire backwards and forwards many times and it'll deform permanently in its new position, but it will take many uh, cycles if it's good steel. And uh, so there is a ductile material. So if you can get that ductility of, of that into your concrete, you've got something that's got resilience for all the forces for which you uh, didn't know were going to occur. Just um, down the road from here, there's a building that always catches my eye because I just live not far from there and people don't know the significance of this building, but that's the Journeyham Apartments in Oriental Bay. And that's one of the first buildings in the world and in New Zealand that actually had uh, that ductile uh, ability built into it, in the, uh, designed in the late 60s, built in the early 70s. So uh, we were a leader in that. That building might not shape up um, to 100% now, but I'd be very surprised if it would actually collapse in a, in a pretty large earthquake because of the resilience, like the coat hanger, that is built into it. So when you go overseas and you wonder why, or come back to New Zealand and wonder why all the columns and the buildings down at the ground level have seemed so big compared with what you've seen overseas in many countries, it's because that we're pushing this uh, strong uh, column, weak beam idea through. And as I was as saying before with the carrot, um, concrete is inherently uh, uh, brittle, but we put um, steel inside it, uh, First of all, to take the tension uh, of, of uh, uh, when you, you put load on it, because the concrete can't take the tension. But then we also bind it up, like that a picture of the uh, building the, that I spoke of as being the ladder with the yellow spots. If you bind up those around those points where you know it's going to break a bit, you can make it um, very resilient. So if you look up at a building being built, you'll notice that the stirrups, the, the binding and the reinforcing cage that they're putting up there is quite dense around the joints, and that's part of the earthquake resilience being built in. Here's an example of a, of a column, in fact, that didn't have enough of that binding, and you can't do much um, uh, when you can't even contain the concrete branching around inside the member. This is what it looks like in a real building. This is out of the PricewaterhouseCooper. Our Christchurch offices were in that uh, 18 or 20 story building. Um, and we are very happy to see that occurring in the beams up above the poor guy's desk um, because um, this binding that's occurred in the concrete has worked very well. It doesn't look very nice, but in fact, uh, I'd rather have been in that building after the, in the aftershocks than in the, the motel in Believ that I was actually in because I knew that this one had lots more resilience in it. Uh, um, and, but you, the concepts that we've done and we've used to date are that the, the, our main concentration was on providing life safety. And we used to tell clients all the time, if you get the design earthquake, your building will be a write-off and everybody would nod uh, wisely. Uh, what's happened on the, on the 22nd of February is we got something that was above the design load and the buildings, in many cases, uh, are right off. There are other things about buildings which make them resilient. And if you think of the um, little girl on the swing here, you know that um, inherently, um, if you push her backwards and forwards, she's going to turn as you push her because the ropes are of unequal length. Similarly, if she's sitting uh, with ropes of equal length on the tree and she's sitting on one side, um, you know that the swing that will, will twist. Well, it's the same with buildings. If the buildings have uh, irregular shapes within them, the support mechanisms, they're going to twist. Twisting is actually very hard to uh, design for, not impossible, but, but hard to design for and much better because we have no idea of the, of the characteristics of the earthquake that we're going to get, the directionality of it, um, how intense, how long, it's actually better to have an, a, a regular structure. The bones of the building need to be regularly placed around it because the building will respond more like it was designed for. And you can therefore uh, 
uh, that's a conflict between the engineer and the architect who normally doesn't want to have a regular building because of its architectural merit. And I have two daughters who are architects, so we argue this quite a lot um, about how they need to lift their game. They don't like that, never like that coming from their father. Uh, another thing that you see very much overseas is that um, uh, a building, uh, um, big investment that a family puts into a building, they often have a shop at the bottom or they want to park the car underneath. And there's another form of eccentricity. And there are some classic buildings around here. You just, there's one that always worries me down Marion Street. Go down there on the end opposite the university and look at the, uh, the, this aspect to that building. I uh, keep away from there. Uh, <laughs> um, risk. What is risk? We don't really understand risk at all, do we? Risk equals hazard times vulnerability. Uh, we can't control the hazard. The lady upstairs who pulls the levers controls the natural hazards in New Zealand, so we can't control that. But we can control the vulnerability of the building. Therefore, in, in a, uh, a low seismic area with a uh, very uh, vulnerable building, you, um, you're still going to get um, high risk. And uh, the reverse, if you have a high hazard and um, you um, make the building very resilient, you will get low risk. So you can't control vulnerability. Frequency, hey, this is really, uh, this is really, really top, top stuff, isn't it? Small earthquakes occur more frequently than large ones. That has been forgotten, I think, in the aftermath of the, of the recent earthquakes. Uh, we have focused on what happens when we win the lotto. Perhaps we should be worried about when we get the third division prize because we're likely to get that a lot more often. Another one which even my family tells me, I don't know anything about earthquakes, my Christchurch family. Uh, earthquakes, uh, a big distant earthquake might have a similar effect to a, a small local one. Well, I wrote this before February 22nd and that is a uh, uh, an example of, uh, of um, the, the February 22nd earthquake, smaller in energy release than the first one, but because it was closer and because it was um, focused on the CBD, it had a much greater effect. So what are acceptable risks? We design, as do most of the world, for 10% uh, probability of damage starting to occur in, in, in a building in one year. Uh, and not, that, that, that um, means that on average, over a long period of time, we can expect to see damage starting to appear in the buildings as frequently as once every 16 to 20 years. So we're not designing earthquake-proof buildings at all. We're accepting quite a level of risk. Not only that, we design them so that um, they are probably a, an economic loss, uh, but have not fallen over. Uh, with a 10% probability of that being um, exceeded in uh, an earthquake uh, occurring that exceeds that in 50 years. That means that we deliberately design a minimum standard for buildings that will reach that on average just less than once every 500 years. Well, it's like talking about the odds in lotto, sometimes you win. So <laughs> the models that New Zealand have for seismicity that are, are run by GNS Science on behalf of the country are some of the best in the, in the world by some of the world leaders uh, in this area. And uh, I think he's still in the audience here, but I remember two years ago in Washington, the, the public face of the faults in New Zealand, uh, Kelvin Berryman, being described by the head of the similar organization in, in the US is the best man in the world for smelling earthquakes. He said, I, this guy can fly over them and smell them from 35,000 feet. We've, we've got uh, a model that is probably the envy of many parts of the world. So we do have some good handle on what the hazard is, but it is what we say probabilistic. It is statistical. We can't tell you whether it's going to occur tomorrow or not, but we can tell you on average over a long period of time with the best information that we know at the moment how long, uh, uh, what, what the levels of shaking might be in a statistical sense. And you can see that deep black line there which follows the, uh, uh, the southern alpine fault uh, 
places not to be uh, if you don't like earthquakes are obviously Hamner Springs and, and around around um, the Oterra Bridge, which we designed. So <laughs> that sort of information comes through to the codes. And uh, so uh, we uh, look up our, our um, New Zealand standard for earthquake design and we turn that information into design levels. And those are the contours for uh, the South Island and the contours for the North Island. And, uh, but but the, the thing which uh, we have difficulty in trying to get across to people is that we, we design buildings for bigger loads in the places where the hazard is highest. So we're trying to um, uh, have an equal risk across the whole of the country. So it always hurts when we see people insurance companies saying or people saying I want to shift to another place because of the concern about earthquakes but in fact we are uh, deliberately trying to make it even across the whole of the country. Our codes do change the loads depending on the importance of the building to society and, and so that we deliberately design hospitals and uh, uh, buildings that we want to have a higher level of resilience and perhaps be um, still available after a pretty big shake to have higher loads, so we deliberately do that. And uh, uh, we try to equate that so that earthquake doesn't um, lie outside some of the other loadings that we have to contend with, the risk of, of them being exceeded, and snow is a typical one, as is wind. <coughs> Just to, uh, this is a little uh, slide which I know it's difficult to understand some of these things, but this is a way in which we, we uh, talk about the frequency content of an earthquake uh, because buildings all have um, different natural uh, modes of vibration and so uh, the way in which they respond in an earthquake does depend on how flexible they are. So we plot up the frequency content of the earthquake in a, in a way which we can understand in terms of, of buildings. And you can see that uh, in general terms in Christchurch, and this was done for the PGC building that we investigated, the, the collapse, that the, uh, the records around the city uh, were up there around about uh, what we were designing for. Just remember, uh, just to emphasize again, that um, we don't know for sure what any building uh, felt in Christchurch because the, uh, there were four uh, stations uh, uh, some distances away from the buildings that collapsed. That whole area of Christchurch is, I like to think of it's like a marble cake. The, river has, the rivers have wandered all over there at different times, depositing all sorts of materials, uh, sands and shingles, uh, a long time ago and more recently. And so um, they're like little bowls of jelly. And, and, and so what your building actually feels uh, in a particular earthquake, particularly a close one, is um, very dependent on, on what exactly what soil it is um, sitting on. And so two uh, buildings that are 100 metres apart that look almost the same might have felt something that was quite different depending on the, on the um, way in which the shaking approached the building and the ground that it was sitting on. The same... Uh, um, don't tell me that we didn't know about liquefaction. Here's some maps that were done uh, 12 years ago, uh, even it might be a little bit longer than that, pointing out about liquefaction. Liquefaction has been known uh, for the last, uh, the effects of it have been known for, for many years. It's had a name and now everybody can spell it uh, for, the, for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, liquefaction, I don't think, killed anybody, but it caused a hell of a lot of damage. Um, there are lots of anecdotes about people being uh, told at design time um, that they could increase the size of their foundations and lower the risk of slumping and, and, uh, and told, you know, you go down this far and you get a certain level of protection. If you go down further to an even more solid layer down below with your piles, you'll have better protection. You know which one people will normally choose. It's a cheaper one. The shaking on the 22nd of, of February was uh, a different kettle of fish when it came to it, to the intensities that were felt. The maximum intensities were many times, uh, or two or three times, uh, what um, we would design for. 
but mercifully that earthquake, because it was a relatively small magnitude, didn't go on for so long. If it had gone on much longer with more cycles of that intense uh, shaking, we would have had a, a vastly bigger problem than we did. And uh, uh, this is for PGC, another way of plotting the earthquakes uh, where we look at the maximum displacements that might occur in, in buildings. Those little straight lines down the bottom show uh, the uh, design that was in place in the 60s for buildings like PGC compared with the shaking that occurred. So you were asking a lot of the ductile, any inherent ductility in the buildings to cover the difference between those two. Building evaluation. The, I believe that the, uh, the Christchurch implemented the guidelines for rapid evaluation extremely well. Some of their staff had been involved with the testing of, of these guidelines, which have we, we've had in place for over 20 years in Indonesia in one of their earthquakes the year before. Unfortunately, uh, even many engineers were not, aware, were not aware of those guidelines and what they might be called upon, uh, that they might be called upon to use them, although they had been used in the Gisborne earthquake. Um, it was ironical that on about the 8th of September I attended a meeting in the Hotel Grand Chancellor in Christchurch where the uh, decision of the Christchurch City Council to lift the level of um, uh, strengthening for damaged uh, uh, lower earthquake prone buildings to two thirds of the current standard was absolutely held down by my own professional colleagues as well from Christchurch. And uh, that was ironical. They were saying, these buildings have stood for a hundred years, this earthquake hasn't knocked them over, why should we be spending more money on them? I think we know the answer to that now. And um, uh, Christchurch was becoming uh, more active, but um, it was years behind Wellington where uh, we ratepayers were paying for the screening of the buildings uh, for earthquake prone buildings. And after the, uh, the perfunctory few front pages of the Dominion Post where, where some people were saying it will kill the city, um, it, people actually settled down and luckily the Indonesian earthquakes came along at about the right time just to settle them down so they understood what was going on. But one of the things that was unexpected, that particularly in the first earthquake, which perhaps um, uh, is more relevant to you people sitting here today, is that the uh, it was, I don't think it was understood by any of us that most of the buildings in the CPD, the commercial buildings, were actually under the uh, property management of just quite a few small com a few companies. They had big portfolios that they were managing. And those people had no idea that the placarding system might come out and they took a while to understand it. But they were very quick off the mark to try to get those buildings back up and running. They had all the keys, for instance. Um, they could control the health and safety aspects. I believe that those um, organizations should be represented on the civil defense and emergency management groups so that they uh, are part of the response uh, after a, a major disaster. And particularly in, as I said, the smaller earthquakes, um, things changed a bit for the second one where the cordons were much longer and tighter. But um, these people, the property managers, were the people that got the city back up and running and got people back into the offices. The cordons uh, were a surprise to many. We are now being asked to help with site selection and one of the criteria that people are coming up with not only the natural hazards, but um, what are the other buildings around the site that you're recommending like because they don't want to be stuck behind a cordon. It's hard for us to be struck with uh, people who have less confidence in multi-story structures. Um, I don't think there's been much in Christchurch other than the stairs, uh, the collapse of stairs, which uh, should feed that. I, uh, that's not... Uh, deprecating the, the scared, the, the reaction of people who were in those buildings. But um, these buildings, um, most modern multi-story buildings are one of the safest places to be. The rapid evaluation was an, an internationally recognized system. It was followed pretty closely, the guidelines that um, were in place, but the public were confused. 
the, uh, it, it was originally an American idea. The Americans keep on saying to us, don't try to enhance it, don't try to make it something that it wasn't. It was a triaging system, it works extremely well. If you listen to, uh, is it Chris Laidler or somebody on the, the national program in the weekend, they spoke about uh, how Christchurch Hospital responded to the earthquake and, they, and I remember hearing them saying that um, a lot of the nurses learned a hell of a lot about triaging, real triaging, when all the people started flooding in with the injuries. They so soon learned to uh, put their training into place to say, uh, leave that person, let's get on with this person triaging. That's exactly what was going on there. It was really wonderful to see how quickly uh, the authorities had a pretty good understanding of what the damage was in the city, and that was the purpose. Uh, originally, 20 years ago, when we, in our committees, we were trying to adapt this for New Zealand, one of the drivers was, in fact, uh, the situation where you might uh, have an earthquake uh, in a densely populated part of the, of the city, and uh, with people in apartments, and you had a storm or you had snow on the ground, uh, you had people standing outside not knowing what to do. And, uh, uh, and, and when you are faced with all these different decisions, one of the best things is to get the people back into buildings, which uh, uh, should be okay. Um, uh, people have tried to hang more on it to that system than was ever intended. And uh, I'm certainly of the belief that we should keep the uh, triaging system uh, uh, as simple as possible and perhaps try to educate ourselves and the public as to uh, what should happen uh, once the emergency period is off. So there were the uh, safety evaluation. Um, I, uh, <coughs> the, in fact, the posters, the placards were, were, were quite explicit if you, if you bothered to read them. Uh, inspected, restricted and unsafe. This is how it was interpreted by a cartoonist for the press. I uh, always wondered why he didn't actually use the real things <laughs> that were on the top instead of the ones that he put around them. I think they might have been more appropriate. Uh, so uh, if you start to put too much more writing on them, you'll find it very hard to, to read. And just on that last one, this was, um, this was the building property manager trying to control the fact that although it had a, from a structural point of view, it had restricted use on it, um, he didn't want the public or too many people in there because uh, the inspections did not cover some of the health and safety things like trip hazards and glass that might still be in the building. People were complaining about getting a red sticker like on the small building to the, uh, to the right on the screen there. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised the people who complained about the unfair stickering when, when somebody could see what they perhaps thought was unfair uh, next door. Just a bit, if, if you come from an area that's not um, uh, been through the, uh, affected so much by the earthquake prone building policy, a little bit of background there. The uh, 2004 Building Act brought in the concept of an uh, earthquake prone building, a building which would um, be seriously affected in a moderate earthquake and the moderate earthquake was set at one third of new uh, building standard. Before that, uh, nobody cared too much of, at all and, and, the, and the engineering profession lobbied hard for this in fact to come in. It's completely arbitrary level of course, uh, uh, and, and the way most, um, most local authorities who were given the uh, ability to have whatever they liked uh, in terms of as long as they met the principles, their own earthquake building policy, most of them followed a cookie cutter version that was put out for them by the Department of Building and Housing. And uh, if they had decided that a building um, might be less than one third they would tell the owners and the owners had six months to respond and if they couldn't show from the rapid screening processes, which are actually very good, you can stand on the side of a street and within half an hour go through a number of little exercises and you'll have a pretty good idea if you know the age of the building and the sort of ground it's on and have a look at the, at the structure as to what it's uh, good for. It's surprisingly accurate. Uh, 
you have, uh, if you can't show that the, that screening was wrong, it goes on to your um, limb and councils are becoming much more proactive there. What does it mean? Well, this is a rough idea of um, if your building's not up to uh, current uh, new building standard, the, uh, the number of times risk, the higher the relative risk if your building is a uh, lower percentage of new building standard. Uh, it's worthwhile just thinking about what the other risks are in life. Our office block here in Wellington is opposite the entrance to the New World Supermarket on Molesworth Street. By far the biggest risk to our employers is dicing with the traffic crossing to get their lunch uh, on a one-way street with people turning from both lanes into the entrance of the, of the uh, supermarket and juggling to change lanes further down to take the motorway or go straight ahead. So uh, uh, the, the earthquake standard that um, we designed for is something for life safety uh, in terms of fatalities per year is something down near death by lightning strike. Um, and and uh, for damage, I'll just go back to uh, uh, the... Uh, for damage, it's about uh, a fifth of that, somewhere about death by fire in the building. So you can see that in general terms, your risk from earthquake have to be measured up against every other risk that you have in life. And you shouldn't um, uh, um, go, you should look after all the risks in your life as well as earthquake. Some practical choices. Fix, fast, and, and forget. I once heard uh, that columnist from Christchurch, Joe Bennett, talk at an earthquake conference, and he said this fix, fast, and forget campaign that EQC's been running with their funny ads on, everybody's got a third of it right. Which third? The forget part. Uh, <clears throat> there was, after, particularly after the first earthquake, there was a huge amount of unnecessary disruption because the most uh, simple things were not done in buildings. Also, uh, colleagues, the building services engineers didn't seem to realize that earthquakes might occur. This building had been occupied out of the airport for five weeks. And look at all the stuff that fell out of the ceiling. It was on our watch too. How would you like that to come down out of the ceiling with that ugly piece of bent steel right where you're sitting? Uh, this, this, a lot of people didn't see inside some of the commercial buildings, but many of them were like this. Uh, and when we went back after the uh, second earthquake, PricewaterhouseCoopers building, all the same bits were lying on the floor. The same, nothing had been done. Very interesting to see what lawyers have got in their <laughs> booze cabinet. We could com compare between the different companies to see the quality of the wine. So. You need to face up to some of the realities. Uh, I've just got to hurry up here, so I'll go through these quickly. Many uh, uh, people chose not to think about earthquakes before the earthquakes. Um, it's important to note that if you're not in Christchurch, you haven't seen the huge publicity that, that was in the, in the papers. The Christchurch papers have had far more information on earthquakes in, than uh, in, uh, in other parts of the country. I like this one uh, on the left there from Inland Revenue. If you look down on the fine print, it says, do not worry if you are late with your payment. Oh, frame that one. <laughs> and even the political parties got in there too with um, uh, holding uh, questions, meetings. Uh, some of these old uh, buildings were never going to survive shaking of that length. Here's a good reason why you don't go uh, outside quickly after an earthquake. You stay inside that scaffolding that fell across the street just near Joe's Garage Cafe. Uh, these buildings are doomed, were always doomed. Um, you can hang on to buildings too long. This building has a very thin, St. Elmo's Court no longer there, has very thin uh, structural elements in it and it's mainly brick. It was unsustainable. Here's a building right beside the CTV building, uh, the remnants of which are in the, in the right hand side there. Les Mills built the year before the earthquake. You wouldn't know that the earthquake had hit it. We do know what to do to get the levels up. Uh, lead rubber bearings and other methods will um, uh, 
provide a huge uh, resilience to, to buildings. People don't like the initial cost, which is very, very small compared with an MRI scanner. Um, and, and other people have picked it up faster than us. This is the Buj Hospital in India, helped by the New Zealand government. Base isolated um, the size of the, of the Wellington Hospital. So in summary, I reckon our current building code has served us uh, very well. We need to take advantage of the heightened level of risk to do something about the worst risks. Don't expect a um, huge change to the levels in the building codes. There are a few uh, technical uh, details that we have to address. Bring the property managers into the CDM groups and, and uh, for that small, more often earthquake, uh, secure the contents to stop the damage and, and don't put up signs of what's going to be your civil defence headquarters in the week before the earthquake to talk about debuilding. I thought that was a rather unfortunate debuilding exhibition. And um, here's the final comment from, um, I'm not sure if it's the Phoenix or uh, Le Ponceur sitting opposite the Forsyth Bar building, all that was left of the old building on the corner of Armagh and Colombo Street. Thank you.